Hello and welcome to this very special podcast today. I've been super excited to share this interview with you because earlier this year, while I was in New York, my husband Daniel, my dear friend Cleona O'Hara and I took a road trip to Wise, a beautiful little town in Virginia. Thinking back, I kept pinching myself realizing the alignment that brought us to that point of being there. I love how life works when we're in the flow and doing what feels good. Now allow me to explain why this was so special. Cleona had connected with a man named Don Green a few months before. Don is the CEO and Executive Director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Now given my work as a Proctor Gallagher consultant and teaching the materials of Think and Grow Rich, written by Napoleon Hill, This was synchronicity at its absolute best for me. Don happily agreed to do this interview with me given the time we spent together in Virginia. And there's no doubt that while I was there, I felt Napoleon Hill's energy as I stood in the offices amidst all of his works. It was truly surreal and a great highlight of my year. I am absolutely delighted for Don's time as he shares here how he came to be the heart and soul of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I am so excited to bring you our conversation. Enjoy. Hello, Don. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so beautiful to have you on this morning. It's my pleasure. It's I enjoy to, I enjoy talking and doing what we do. Uh, otherwise, I'm I'll be 82 real soon. I wouldn't be doing this. Uh, I'm not doing this to make a living. I'm doing it to make a life. Yeah, yeah. And you and you look you look amazing. I was so blessed to have met you earlier this year. But I first want to introduce you to all of our listeners. So Don Green, I've got the absolute privilege and honor to speak with him today. He is the CEO and executive director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And for all of you who who know, I'm, you know, I'm a Proctor Gallagher consultant. I teach the materials of Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. And it's certainly been a book and works that have made such a difference to my life and many others. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have Don Green with me this morning. Um, We met earlier this year. We were very blessed, my husband and I visited Don in Virginia, Wise Virginia, earlier this year, and it was an absolute blessing and a treat. And so I was thrilled when Don agreed to do this interview with me today so that he can share a little about the Napoleon Hill Foundation and what it does. Um, It's, you know, Napoleon Hill himself made a massive difference in his lifetime in writing this and you know all of the materials that went into think and grow rich and so many other books and i just wanted to give don an opportunity to share about that um don would you like to introduce yourself and share a little bit about you and how you came to be at the napoleon hill foundation okay well my name's don green i'm I'm from virginia I'm the son of a coal miner. My dad, mom and dad grew up in depression, seventh grade education. And uh, they knew the importance of it, but uh, they thought their children got a high school education. That was really, really something. And they were very proud of the fact uh, we eat good. Uh, That's a rough life working in the coal mine. So many of them get crippled. Uh, They did not waste their money. I can remember being told, oh, we can't waste money. Your dad may get hurt or get killed in the mines. And uh, I developed a uh, neck for, you might say, being an entrepreneur at an early age. Uh, I can recall when we got running water in the house, uh, I think I was about the seventh or eighth grade. We didn't have any indoor plumbing or so forth. Uh, but everybody in the country lived the same way. We eat real well. They killed hogs and put them up. They canned a lot, a lot of uh, food. And uh, just uh, we eat real well. It was, it was obvious, but it was uh, they bought very little stuff at the at the store, but but I developed the neck for reading. I loved to read as a youngster. I read everything, and we did. We was blessed with good libraries, um, and I can remember the high school library of uh, gosh, we had uh, two girls were sisters. They were twins, 
Maxine and Geraldine. I fell in love with both of them. They was older than I was, but they worked study hall period, and that's when you got to go to the library. So I would run in there and get a book, especially on the weekend from one of them, and then I put it in my locker, and then I go back later when the other one was working, and I get another one. Now, the lady that run the uh, library, she protected those books from her life. She did not could not stand the thoughts of a student having two books out at one time. But I could read more than one book, especially on the weekends and in the winter months. So I thought I was really pulling one over. They were the girls were older than me, but they know what I was doing. But anyway, I read the biographies and all, and uh, it just it just clicked on me somewhere along the line that people like my dad made a living working in the coal mines. But the people I'm reading in the books, it really did well. They used their mind. And I'd bound and determined I was going to get an education. The school here was only a two-year college at the time when I went in 61. And But I went to work at a dollar and 15 cents an hour. And they called me hot shot because I had a lot of energy. And I was practicing the principles of going the extra mile, not only going the extra mile, but then some. And uh, I uh, was a young finance branch manager. The fact is, I had a letter from a company somewhere along the line many years ago that I was the youngest branch manager in the company's history. And um, I just lo- I just love what I was I love what I was doing. I've always taken care of the other people. I never fired nobody. I never have no personnel turnover because believe me, I take care of the people that I work with. Nobody works for me. They work with me. And I work harder than anyone in creating things that will generate. Uh, and, and I'm looking I'm looking out for them because I know the trustees can read the balance sheet and they can see what we're doing. And they I know they'll take care of me because that's not the reason I'm working, because I got an adequate income through investments and so forth. I was a bank president for 18 years. But but uh, you you asked about how I come to the job. I think there's about 350 million people in the United States. And if you ever come to visit us again, if you count them, I think there were what, the three red lights and probably two of them we could do without. So we're a small town. How did an old boy that grew up in this area become CEO? No doubt the best position in the world, in my opinion, uh, as of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. They did not contact me. And I've used it. Uh, uh, I've used it over and over again. Sometimes your ship don't come in, but who says you can't swim out where it is? I wrote them a letter. I was a bank president. I didn't need I didn't need nothing from them. I'd been I was chairman of the board of a local hospital. I'd been president of the chamber of commerce. Did all kinds of business. I go on, on, on. I did not need it, but I gave a little talk at the um, historical society of Pound, Virginia, it's where he was from. Some of those people there did not even know who he was. And I'm and I'm I'm thinking, you know, I, I th- two things I remember. One, I didn't get a meal, and the other, they didn't, they didn't pay me. But I enjoyed talking about Napoleon Hill. But I thought about it on the drive back home, probably fifteen minute drive. And so I, before I went to bed, I took my pad out and I wrote a letter to the um, to the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I told them what I was doing and what I what I learned and so forth and so on. And I got a letter back from Mr. Stone. I think he's a billionaire. And he invited me to come up and have dinner with him. And I thought it was a pleasure, uh, you know, to go have have dinner with him. Met at the airport, where I, and he knew some of the people in the airlines, and they had a meeting room, and they catered us a dinner. And he finally, he called me boy. He said, boy, you know more about these books than I do. He said, you ought to be a board member. And I said, Mr. Stone, what do I need to do? And started this up with the foundation on Monday. And we just it just took off. I mean, they... They didn't have the foreign markets. They had one foreign publisher. And today we have over 500 foreign publishers, 35 in Russia alone, because I recently I recently had Zane count them because of the, one of our trustees adopted a couple of kids from Russia. And he said somebody had asked him, and he said, I'll check. And so I had Zane add them up and count them. But uh, uh, we uh, have done tremendously well at uh, at what we're, uh, what we're doing. And... Um, People are very kind to us, very supportive of us. But my opinion of taking a job was, gosh, I don't know. I won't rattle them off, but I had a cable TV, spring water, I had a Dollar General store, Pizza Plus. I developed land for Walmart, had a dry clean business. And I said cable TV. I did all kinds of things just because I could. And uh, 
So I didn't really, I didn't really need something else to do. But I thought, well, this is a change. I believe I can make some money, and we'll, we'll, I'll help the college out. And uh, that was my goal. And uh, we've done tremendously, tremendously well. And I've been on the board here for twenty some years. I'm president of the foundation board, which is a arm that raises money for the college. It's a non-paying job, but I have a lot of contacts because I was in the banking business, and we've done fabulously well at that. Um, and um, it's just been, uh, you know, I started the class in 1998 when I was still working. I called it Keys to Success, talked to 17 principals, gave them the money back. And of course, they've been taught 24 years. And if that book he read, The 101 Attributes, the guy wrote about me, there were 12 of those people, students, and one of them, the lady's a tax attorney. And she told, and she said in that book, and, and she told me that she said, though it's been 24 years, her test paper, she still had in her desk drawer in her law office. And she said, every once in a while, I will pull it out and read what you wrote on it. And said, it still inspires me. And she's very, 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 very successful. So the success stories are just absolutely un- unbelievable. I know a lot of them don't, no doubt, don't keep up with us, but many, many of them do, uh, even especially from first class. Uh, one of them become a business partner. Uh, that's a, he's enough on him to write a book. Uh, but but uh, the story, and that's the reason I do what I do. And so this past spring, I don't know why, but some come to me. Why don't we offer it to high school kids? Because I see more and more of the students finishing three years. I had one little girl work with me for six years, starting in high school. She finished in three years. I said, she's a pharmacist today. She was valedictorian, as smart as she could be. And then the other little girl, Brooke, had come after Tasha. Brooke uh, worked six years, starting in high school through college. She's a medical doctor today. And then, then the first little girl's pharmacist, she only had one sibling in her family, her brother. And, of course, I knew him when he was little, and he kept telling his grandmother, who worked with me for 17 years, why can't I work for Don? Sissy worked for Don. Why can't I work for Don? So I t- they kept telling me, and I said, I can't let him work. He gets 14. You get a work permit, and I won't get in trouble. So I hired him when he was in eighth grade. 14 years old, I paid him 10 bucks an hour for 20 hours a week. And that's a lot of money back then. And he's been here 12 years. He's uh, finishing three years. And he's got his MBA on the side in accounting. And um, married, got his first house financed when he was 21 without any help. He started college at 17 with a retirement account. I showed him how to set up at 17. And he also had a stock account, was taking his money and buying stock. And uh, it's and he's been here 12 years. He's only he's only 26 years old. But uh, the stories of the of the the people that's been exposed to it, I just I just love just love the stories. It's heartwarming. That's the reason I do what I that's the reason why I do what I what I do today. We did yeah. a professorship in Hill's name. And so, Don, what I'm hearing is that whatever, you know, whatever materials you're giving them, you're teaching them, you're able to contribute to them. It's having them. I love that you're working with young people and and I'm sure I'm not the only one because it just makes for a wonderful world ahead. And you're teaching them, as I know, in these materials that how to think, yes, how to think, how to create how to be better people, uh, how to give impression of increase, like all of that. Would you say that's what's happening with these young people you're helping? Yes. Yes. Uh, young people are easier to mold, good or bad. They're more they're more adaptable to it. Us old people, we think we know it all. You know, I mean, I mean, it's true. It's it's much harder to unlearn someone is, and we don't get into religion, but uh, I read a lot. And uh, Jesus picked apostles and they were nobodies. He did not have to unlearn them. That's my theory. Uh, he could have got the people that was highly educated. He'd first have to unlearn them from what they had believed in and then teach them. So he, he basically started what I would say with an empty vessel. And so the y- youngsters are much easier to, to uh, work with. Of course, they're also much easier to influence. And it can, of course, it can help both ways. So that's the reason that we teach. It's really, really important. If you walked in, my, if you remember in my office, or 
a lot of my social media lady put up two ways to learn once from books and others being around smarter people. So both of them are extremely important in uh, in forming our opinions and and what and uh, what we want. It was June 1975. It was 47 years ago. It was like it was five minutes ago. He said, Don, you do a little extra one day, it won't matter. You do it for a week, probably nobody notices it. But he said, I promise you, if you'll work harder than the other people around you, one of these days you'll be the success most of the world can only dream about. He's a mentor today and a supporter, and I still remember our conversation. And he's also an avid reader. 99% of the stuff that happens to us is not important. Now, you can get upset over a broke toenail or a fingernail or a scratch on your car or what have you. But in the realm of things, is it really important? I mean, when you find out you got cancer, uh, your mate's got cancer, something like that. Now, then that's the time to get concerned. But for most of the little things happen in life, somebody pulls out in front of you in traffic or whatever, or, uh, it, it's no big deal. And, and one, of the, one of the lessons that I've tried to talk over and over and over, we cannot control how people act. What we can control is how we react. And that's what's important. You know, someone can walk up to you and say, you're not dressed proper for this interview. And you can let it bother you. Or you could or you could say to yourself, I'm not dressed properly. If you looked in the mirror this morning at yourself, you know, it's where, where we get in trouble is, is when we feed ourselves negative information because we tend to believe what we tell ourselves. You call it auto-suggestion or, or what you want to call it. But things we repeat becomes a part of us, either negative or positive, and they're extremely important. I used a book, um, to say the guy's last name real good, he's got a PhD, and it's on auto-suggestion. It's Shad Hemsettler. He said, wrote a book, and I used to quote it in college in the class. It's, it's simply, what do you say when you're talking to yourself? That is the most important conversation you'll ever have in your life is the ones you have with yourself. Yeah. He'll in one place, he give 30 some reasons, negative statements people say to themselves, like, I never have no money at the end of the month. Nothing goes my way. They're not going to harm me. I mean, why would we tell ourselves this way or, or I'm always getting, putting on weight? You know, we have to see ourselves as we want to be rather than as we are. And uh, you can use a quote from Job. It says, without a vision, my people perish. And that's simply seeing things are in our eyes and to where we want where we want to where we want to be at in life. It's extremely it's extremely important. You know, I got a little sign in my car and in the office and in, in the house. It says, come out one of the books I published. It's as simple says, if it is to be, it is up to me. And, you know, we can blame our parents. They didn't send me to Harvard. They probably did the best they could under the circumstances. Get over it. That's the reason they call it the past. You know, I, I, for example, when I was in high school, it was 54, 55. I graduated in 59. That's when the Corvette and the T-Birds come out. Some of those kids from good families, they, they, here they are driving new, in high school, driving new T-Birds and, uh, and Corvettes. I worked and I, and I bought a 36 Ford for $400. I was the most happy boy on earth because see why? It was mine. I knew I earned it. I worked, I worked for that thing. And plus, it was a nice car, <laughs> and I enjoyed it, enjoyed it immensely, and I was extremely proud of it because I earned it. But those things we earn is what we have pride in, knowing that we can go out and do something on our own. And it's, uh, I, had a, I had a good friend tell me my daughter, only child, was working in a dime store. I, I, I don't think he paid me 75 cents or something. He told me, he said, of course, he's a good friend. He, he said, it doesn't look good a bank president's daughter having to work. I said, no, you don't get it. She loves what she's doing. She knows what time she's got to be there. She's learned to make change. I said, she learned how to talk to people. And, and, and today, her success is unbelievable. She owns three businesses. She's a CPA. She's got rental property in Hilton Head. And, and, uh, and it wasn't money for me. It's, 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 she earned. Yeah. Uh, shortly yeah. after she was married, her husband told me, he said, I believe your daughter, I could take her out in the country and set her up on a big rock. And before the day is out, she'd be making money or something because it, that entrepreneur spirit is just in her, you know, seeing things that she can, that things she can do. And, and plus, she's a very giving person. She's a very giving person also, which she hopes she learned a little bit from me or a lot from her mom. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm sure.
I'm pretty sure she did learn that from you. Absolutely. And, you know, what I love, the two things that you said there is that she, she loves what she does. And it's so important to love what you do. And because that is what life is, to really love what you do and to make a difference, to do something that's serving someone else. And also auto suggestion, you mentioned that, like what we say to ourselves. And I just, again, love that you're, you know, supporting young people, children, young people to, to really talk well to themselves, tell themselves that anything that they, they want is possible. And I'm always saying to clients, make auto suggestion your best friend, make it your best friend and say good things to yourself always because you're the one you're listening always i know you've heard this saying you can wake up and say god it's morning or you can say good morning god you know completely different just a tone of your voice the way you say the words i got a little three by five cards on my table where i eat alone in the morning for seven and a half years but it simply says god show me someone i can help today in jesus name amen i know for today's out i'm going to be able to give a good conversation to someone i'm going to mail someone a book I'm going to do something or another that says, yeah, I'm trying to make a difference. And, I, and I'm using someone else's bit, but you can't do everything, but you can do something. And that something can make all the difference in the world to that person that you uh, had the positive effect on. And it's a good feeling. I mean, uh, Acts 20, 35 tells us more blessed to give and receive than I'm not preaching to you. But we don't do it with intent. I'm helping young people. They will, never, they will never do anything for me except what they've already done. They allowed me to feel good about myself that I was trying to help somebody else. I'm not expecting them to be donors or, or whatever. I'm hoping that they get enough lessons that when they reach maturity, that uh, they'll see that someone helped them. Maybe they'll do the same for someone else. And that's all I can hope for. If they do, fine. It, it, uh, if they don't, that's fine. That's fine, too. I did my part. And then I can't control how they I can't control how they act. But I don't know I don't know of a better life because happiness is helping other people. It's important to look forward instead of looking back. You can always find I you can I'm sure you've heard people talk about your grade school teacher wasn't far come or did this or that. Get over it, you know, get over it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but because you can't do nothing with what's already happened. And, and um uh, to say and you can't put the baby back when you want sure you got to do the best you can take care of it and do what your a responsible parent's supposed to be yeah. and uh and that's the same thing with what's happened you can learn from it from what happened in the past i mean so many people you said a good word you said passion without a passion you'll never be happy because you got to have a passion that's something that drives you i said if you wake up thinking about it you should think about it during lunch think about it before you go to bed what you're what you're uh dreams are and what you want to lay lay out and and um, and put it down in writing and say this is basically a contract with yourself said this is what I'm going to do I had a lady one time at a speech at Chamber of Commerce told me school teacher break said I talked about goals she said she had her goals but she just didn't write them down I said that's what we call dreams we write them down and say this is what I'm going to do and and put a date on it. We might not make it to that date. It does not mean we fail. It's simply some unforeseen circumstances that come up. It delayed delayed them. But you don't look at it. It's people look at failures as something or other to stop them. You should look at our failures as lessons learned and say, oh, I didn't turn out right. But that don't mean you're supposed to quit. I mean, if you and I was talking to Florida, we know we got to go south and we get to down to Asheville, which I'm going down through there Saturday. Uh, and and these, uh, the winter has caused the roads to, to collapse and you, as far as you can go. Yeah. But you can turn around, take another route and still go on to Florida. You say, well, go back home. Couldn't do, couldn't do that. So many people, rather than taking it as lesson learned, they look at it as an obstacle to, to get, make them stop, but see what they didn't have was passion. If they look at it as an obstacle, they say, well, I shouldn't have tried that. My spouse told me I was crazy for starting that. My friends told me I, I'd never do it. I guess that's right. And you just quit and go on, your dream dies in you. But if you have a passion for it, you know, you say, well, I didn't work that time, but I, I should have done this or I should have done that. And uh, if you take it as lessons learned, there's no such thing as permanent failure. 
uh, which at least we accept it as such. And it's important. It's important to develop that kind of attitude. And like you said, there's a learning. There's a learning in everything, and it's important to see that learning. Yeah. If you've got the love, I love what you said. If you've got the passion, you're not going to see it as an obstacle. You'll just find that you'll just think, well, there must be another way. What, what's the solution? What's something else I can do yeah. to get there? I wonder. That's what I talked about: the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, the class voted me the best speak of the semester or something or other, whatever was was fun. But we with that we get to choose. You know, there's a story. There's a story. Uh, uh, God, see, it's a crowd. Uh, it's got the word crowd. It's been a long time. But it was a story of World War Two where these this guy's a businessman got a briefcase and so he's approached with this guy, and uh, he's approached with this guy and. Um, I see it's everybody here. He only crowds one of the words in it. But anyway, he's approached by this guy. It's obviously a bum. And I think it was in Austria. It was a train station. And he was bumming for something to drink. And the guy, the business guy said, I'll give it to you. But just ask me, ask you, how did you end up like in this kind of condition? Well, said my mother died and said, the authorities come and got my brother and my sister. And they put us in different homes and said, I've never seen that on since. I said, uh, uh, my dad was a, my dad was a drunk. And said, uh, so we end up in homes and said, I've not seen that on since then. And uh, he said, he would come in, he would come in drunk, beat my, beat my mother up and so forth and so on. And the guy, the business guy said, you know, that's kind of weird. He said, I had a similar circumstance. He said, I remember the car drove off and, uh, and, uh, and my little sister's waving at me and so forth and so on and said, I've never seen them since. These guys were brothers. One of them took a position. My dad was a drunk and I ain't no better than he is. The other one said, my dad was drunk and ain't going to happen to me. But that was a decision each one of them made. But these guys were brothers. They were they were brothers. Huh? Wow. Yeah, it was a tremendous story. But each one of them had the choice to make. And one of them said, said uh, and, and, and of course, we could ask ourselves, why would someone make that kind of choice? About the best answers I can give you. It's just a mystery of the mind. I don't know why people react the way they way, way they do. Uh, and, uh, but it's but it's in their but it's in their mind. Yeah. One of them took an easy way out and said, "I don't have to prove nothing. My dad's a drunk. I'll be just as good as he was." And other than said, "Hey, my dad's a drunk. Ain't gonna happen to me." So you know that's a choice, and that's where everything. That's what we talked about the importance of the mind. It's first in the minds and in the decisions that we make. And those decisions become habits. Too many bad decisions will get develop habits and we're, and we're losers. Too many and make the good habits and we have success. Yeah. But we get we get we're in control of that, whether we realize it or not. And it all starts off in it all starts off in the mind. Yes, all of it, all of it. Now, just just briefly, I, I love everything that you're saying, but I'm also um, aware of time, and I would love for you to share a little bit about. Um, For those listening who don't know Napoleon Hill, okay, so could you just share a little bit about the man, Napoleon Hill? Well, Napoleon was born in 1883 in southwest Virginia, and he was born in poverty, and the family were uneducated. Basically, the boys got went to work in the mines when they were 14 years old. School wasn't mandatory. They went three or four months a year. When it was in winter and they wouldn't, you know, they couldn't work outside or you know, in a in a farming and so forth, and uh, so it wasn't wasn't stressed. The girls got that age; they got married. It gave them an opportunity. Maybe they'll do a little better and move out, and that that's just the way it was. But until Napoleon around two eight nine, his mother died, and he she was a a child bride. She's only twenty four, I believe. She died. I know I put a new tombstone up to her. Years ago, her and uh, J.B. Hill, uh, Napoleon's grandson. And, uh, but uh, in, anyway, the dad remarried about within a year, and he married a widow woman who was educated. She was a school teacher. Her father was a uh, doctor, and her husband was a local, had been a local high school principal. So she was educated, and she come into the, into the family, and she changed things. She stressed education. She said, we're not going to remain in poverty. And she stressed education, and she's the one about got to heal a, a typewriter when you're 13, and and she mentored to him, you might say, and and uh, and he adored her because she made him feel she made him feel important, 
And the other times he'd always just been punished for things he did. And they described him as the meanest boy around. He said, no, he's just got an energy. It's not been directed in the right places. So that woman, uh, that woman, uh, she, uh, she encouraged him. And so he was writing stories when he was 13. Of course, he went to a bit, he went to a business school about eight months in nearby County to become a mail secretary. And he went to work for a, for a man named Rufus Ayers, who had been in had been in the Civil War, and he had uh, read law and become a lawyer. And he went to work for him because he's very prosperous. He'd been turned he was turned been attorney general of the state of uh, of Virginia, and uh, he did lumber business, coal business, and uh, built banks and what have you. So he he thought this is the richest man around. So he wrote him a letter and offered to work for him for free to see what he was worth and then and then and uh but he started my salary at 50 dollars a month but he worked for him and he got enthused about being a lawyer and he told his younger half brother vivian he said hey let's go to georgetown university i'm good enough right now i'll write and pay our way through and they both went to georgetown law school georgetown university and uh and uh but it didn't work out exactly that way in, in during vivian graduated he dropped out he run an ad in a paper for a, looking for a, a bride and a, and a girl answered it. And actually the one that answered it wasn't the one he hooked up with. There were two girls living in a boarding house and the one that he took a fancy to each other was a, uh, her, uh, was a niece of the governor of West Virginia and it was a wealthy family. And uh, uh, he, he run, we've even got a copy of that ad. He said, well, I'm about Sarah, Southern gentleman. I would like to meet a nice refined lady willing to meet parents uh, and so forth and so on. And, um, and, and they, they married and was married 25 years. They had three sons. They all turned out remarkably well, but, but uh, she divorced him after 25 years because he was never home. He, he was in this material so much. One place in one year ago, he was in 84 different cities in one year. He'd go anywhere. He was so believed in what studying, why are some people wealthy and others not? And he interviewed these people, and uh, he, he, I would say he was not a good father because he never was home. But his grandson, who's on our board, he's a medical doctor, Jimmy, said that material cost him his wife, cost him his, uh, his marriage, because she was in love with him. And we probably got 100 letters he wrote her while they was, he was always promising her big things and so forth and getting together. And he bought a 725 acre estate up in Upper New York, and he was riding Rolls Royce at times, you know, the traffic's in up and down with uh, the depression two world wars but she divorced him but she never remarried she's evidently she stayed in love with him and uh, of course then he had another marriage at, after that one failed married a woman 30 some years younger than him and it was doomed to fail <laughs> and she, but she ended up with uh, with his Rolls Royce and his, his book rights but then he married a lady and he courted for a year had never been married when he, in 1941. In fact, as I wrote the book, he gave her, which is a class, to one who has, to Norma, uh, Anna Norma. Uh, Norma was her last name, who has personality and initiative, all these other qualities. And then two years later, uh, they courted. She, uh, uh, I said she hadn't been married, but she worked for a publishing company. And the guy also was president of Presbyterian College in Glenton, South Carolina, had his own publishing agency. And she worked for 20 years to, she dropped out of, actually 28 years, she dropped out of school because her father died her death and there were seven in the family. She stopped, start quit college to help support the family. But but uh, he wrote in a book again on December 23rd, 1943, and it was in her belongings, which she died in 84, which I have in the archives. And it said, uh, you had the author, a book, now you've got the author. That's the only book I've seen, he signed twice. But, uh, but she took over the business. He had no problems from 43 till he died in 1970. And they had a, their, the life ambition, or, and her more than anyone, was to set it up as a nonprofit to keep his legacy going to what he, what he had studied and so forth. And they found the Napoleon Hill Foundation in 62 when he was 79 years old. So he didn't do a tremendous lot because he died when he was 87. And, uh, but uh, she kept, she's one that, Got the board together and kept it kept it going, and they put the copyrights of the books into into the into the foundation, and yeah. Um, yeah. and it turned out well. And Don, with um, I mean, most people know that the book Thinking Grow Rich, 
Can you just share briefly how he came to writing that book? Uh, yeah, he, he um, of course, at, uh, it's, at the, I guess the initiative of it, it was in 1922. Uh, yeah, 1922, he delivered a back at the graduation uh, at uh, Salem University in West Virginia and um, typically got $50 or $100. It was only 20 some in the class. One of them was Jennings Randolph, who later became a senator. And he wrote Hill and said, that material's ever in a book. He said, I'd like to get the first copy. And we have that letter. And he later served on the board. But he said, I'm at least that you talk. And I, I made up my mind to serve the people of West Virginia. So he went back in 1957, 35 years later, and he did the graduation speak again. And he gave a speech, which I did in a book called Five Essentials. At, uh, and he reminded them what all occurred between 1922 and 1957 in that 35 year span. And um, the fact is, he published this, his in this pa pamphlet, Five Essentials. And I took it and composed it and made a, made a nice little uh, gift book out of it. It's done. It's, uh, it's, it's done, real, done real well. But uh, uh, he, many, many, many people will tell me on the phone, it's not about money. Yeah, it was about money. The original copy of the Think of the Rich, which we re reproduced, it says up the top, for men and women who resent poverty. And in the book, he said he wrote the book for the millions of men and women who were in poverty, living in poverty, and the fear of poverty. And uh, and uh, so that was what it was was about. And of course, I think it's a it's a, a catchy title, Think and Grow Rich, but. Uh, I don't care if you discuss law of attraction, whatever. It's more to it than just thinking, you know, because he mentions the word action 77 times in that book. Get, get something that you have a passion for, make plans. And then he says, start out for you're ready or not, because you can always adapt your plans. Most people never even get started. So the starting is the most important part of it. Even if it's not a good plan, you can adapt to it, get somebody to help it smarter than you are, whatever. But the main thing is pick something or other for a purpose that you have a passion about, not to go, oh, I go out there and make a lot of money. I guess that's the reason people go gamble. I think I can do something or other and walk away with a wheelbarrow full of money. But no, that's not a good reason. It's to find something or other that people have a need for or they have a want. And the only way you can make money legitimately is to sell something. You can either sell a good or you can sell your service. If you can shoot a basketball or hit a baseball or you can dance, uh, tell jokes or whatever, act, whatever, uh, some people will pay you money. The better you are, the more they'll pay you. Or you can manufacture a better mousetrap, better or cheaper or, or promote it more, whatever a product that people either want or they need. And, that, and that's, a, that's about it. And it's our point finding out what people want or what they need, not, what, not necessarily what we want. Yeah. And uh, and once that plan is enacted, then, then then you're on your way and you can always adapt it. See, the first night I would tell the students was when you go home, do me a favor. I don't worry you're going to a room, a dorm, your home or, or where. But look on your calendar and see if you find someday. There is no such thing as someday. When we say someday I'm going to start planning retirement, someday I'm going to pay my credit card off, someday I'm going to start watching my way, someday. Someday is a light way, nothing but a lie to ourselves because there is no someday. We have to commit and say, this month I'm going to pay an extra $25 on my credit card and not charge anything else until it's paid or what. Make some commitment, put it down and write, and it just becomes a part of you. Not keep telling yourself when I get a raise, some, I get the next raise, I'm going to do. No, you won't. The money will go to something else. You'll find another way to absorb it, and it all it, it all starts out in it, it all starts out in the, in the mind that our our planning and what what we can do, and then making a and then making a commitment. Uh, but uh, most people don't. But then it's not that people are planning to fail; they just fail to plan. Good time to start. Good time to start today because there's nobody going. Right. Nobody's That's going good. to. Uh, nobody's going to get some market out. Uh, but uh, um, we only have now. There is only now. And I, I just have a, I have a faith in business because I think they played a great part in this uh, in, uh, in in our lifestyle that we live so much better than our parents did, uh, and better and they live better than their parents did because of progress. Uh, 
yes. the things you talk about. And yeah. I guess I just, I guess I'm just, I'm just an optimist. Just wow. excuse wow. me. Don, look, we're just, this has been so amazing. I absolutely love it. I could talk to you all day. Could you share how people, if they want to support the Napoleon Hill Foundation in any way, how they go about doing that? Well, our website is naphill.org, and uh, we have all of our books up there and our courses, and um, uh, there's many ways they can support us. Uh, you know, they can find a way if they if they really want to, buying our books, telling other people about them. We have some online courses. In fact, is um, you 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 know I'm developing a, a course with uh, with uh, my friend uh, Cleona O'Hara on self confidence. We hope to launch it March April no November one, and I think it'll help a lot of uh, I think it'll help a lot of people because without self confidence, you're not going to be successful. If you don't develop a belief in yourself that you can do it, you're not going to start. Mm-hmm. Or, or if you do start, you're not going to put the effort out necessary. you got to have a self-confidence and, and a passion. And there's so many qualities that go with self-confidence, like like having having goals, having a, 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 a starting point of all achievement. It's, yes. it's, a, it's a purpose. And without it, you're not going to do it. But then the other things, extra mile, we know is an absolute must if you're going to rise above the crowd. That's the name of that book, Rise Above the Crowd. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> there it is. About. There it is right I can't there. Remember the, I can't remember the writer, but it's Rise Above the Crowd. Uh, but in, in any way, those other qualities, you know, like applied faith, the belief system, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and so forth. And, and under those other qualities of confidence is, you know, comes honesty and humility and and, uh, and, and, so, and so forth. And say so many qualities that develop. But self-confidence is an absolute must. And the fact is, I asked a professor who went to school uh, when I did. He's got a PhD in psychology, and we're friends. He's retired, but uh, but uh, we have lunch together once in a while. And I asked him once, if you could just pick out the general population of the college, he's been he's been involved in college all his life. And I said, for, for what would you think it would be? He says, lack of confidence in themselves. They see it in other people, in the movie stars, or in the sports people, or what have you but it's never transferred to them. Hey, that could be me. Yeah. Uh, and he said the lack of confidence, because you, you and I know that without the, without the confidence, I don't mean this some, I'm jump over a 50 foot bill and not get hurt or something, something that's plumb stupid. Uh, I mean, just a, a feeling inside that, hey, I really want this. I really don't know all the answer to it, but I'm willing to get some plans. I'm ready to start. Yeah. And if I, and if I and if I do run up against something or other, I know there's answers to it. I can seek other help and so forth. It's just that feeling that everything's going to be okay. And uh, and uh, without that, there's no point. There's no point going on. You know, if you don't have a confidence that things are going, to, that things are going to turn out. And um, and um, I don't apologize for being an optimist. Uh, everybody has bad things that happen to yourself and can question yourself. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? Get over it. You know, I'm including losing a spouse or what have you. It happens all the time. You know, some things you can't explain, but you can keep the memories. But you don't live in the, you don't live in the past. Uh, you live in you live in the, you live today, and um, and and you can plan for tomorrow, but when we don't have it, so we can't keep kicking the can down the road and say, well, when I get this done or when the little girl get, when she gets out of school, I'm gonna do this, or when we get him through college, we'll do this or what have you. You know, that's just that's a plot lie to yourself. There's no reason you can't be working on it at the same time. Make a, excuses don't get you nowhere. You might as well go out on the front porch, sit down in the rocking chair, sit there and rock all day. It may feel good, but it won't take you where you want to go. No. And look, I'm so with you. Self confidence is the key to everything. So now, just again, what was the website address for Nepal? Is it Nap Hill, did you say? NapHill.org. N-A-P-H-I-L-L dot O-R-G. Dot O-R-G. Okay, beautiful. O-R-G. Because I'm sure that there will be people listening who would love to support Napoleon Hill. And I think the self, Cleona's, we're calling it the self-confidence camp. Yes. Um, And I I think uh, with the material we're gathering and whatever, of course, she's very enthusiastic and, uh, and comes across uh, 
where it comes across real good. I think we'll, uh, I think we'll do real, I think we'll do real well. It's going to be amazing. It's yeah, going to be amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Don. I really, really appreciate it. It was so wonderful being with you. Well, you're very welcome. I enjoy it. You know I do. Thank I you hope it comes for sharing. Obviously, that I love what I do. Yes, you do. And you're, yeah, I mean, that that is the message. Love what you do and uh, do all you can to help others. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.